Hi, and welcome to the iPhone Life podcast. I'm Donna Cleveland, Editor-in-Chief at iPhone Life. And I'm David Averbach, CEO and publisher. Each episode, we bring to you the best apps, top tips, and great gear in the iOS world. And uh, we have a great episode ahead for you. Thank you for joining us. David, do you want to tell us about our sponsor for this episode? I do, and I'm excited because this is a, sometimes it's just timed perfectly. Uh, and this is one of those times where this is the perfect sponsor for right now. For those of you whose New Year's resolutions are lose weight, get in shape, get healthier, I have a great product. Uh, it's one of my favorite smart health products, and that's the Withing Smart Scale. Uh, I think it's called the Body Plus, and I've, you've heard me talk. If you listen to the podcast regularly, you've heard me talk about it regularly, um, because I I own it. I've owned it for like seven, eight years. So long before they were a sponsor, I got it right when it first came out. And there's a few things I love about it. Number one, it can track multiple people, so you can have multiple people that you're that use the scale. Um, and number two, as I'm kind of implying there, it tracks your weight over time. And I find that to actually be really helpful in understanding my own health patterns of what it is that's helping me lose weight or gain weight, things like that. Uh, it's also just fun if you use it for like like I've been for seven eight years. You can just look at your overall health trends over the such an extended period of time. Um, it also, if for those people who are not necessarily just going by weight, it does body mass index, uh, and it has a lot of other really just smart features built in. It'll tell you the weather. So in the morning, as you're standing on the scale, it tells you the weather. It keeps track of carbon dioxide in the air. Uh, it keeps track of your heart rate. Um, all sorts of really great features packed into this. So that's the Withing Body Plus. Yeah, that's a great like, new year, new you product. <laughs> it really is. I was proud of my timing on this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, I wanted to tell you about our daily tip newsletter. If you go to iphonelife.com slash daily tips, you'll get one free tip in your inbox every day that teaches you something cool you can do with your iPhone that you didn't know about before. So this is a really fun, low commitment, free way to up your iPhone skills. I highly recommend you go and check it out. And I have a tip I wanted to share with you uh, all this week, and that's how to take a screenshot on your iPhone or iPad um, using Siri. So Ooh. now you don't have to you don't have to use like the volume button and the side button to take a screenshot. You can just say, "Hey Siri, take a screenshot when you're looking at the display that you want a screenshot of," and it will just do it for you. And I think that. Um, this is a really nice thing if like you're out walking and you want to take a screenshot and you don't want to like stop and have to like you know press with both of your fingers. Um, I think that like it could also be a good accessibility feature is if you have an, you know shaky hands or something like that, it would just eliminate any issues around it. Also, I just know a lot of people who have trouble taking screenshots. They're always like. I have a hard time pressing the buttons at the same time, or I press the side button first by accident and it goes to the sleep screen instead of um, taking the screenshot first. So this, you just eliminate any any finesse that's needed to take a screenshot. <laughs> I mean, that's what I was just getting ready to say is like, certainly as an accessibility feature, it's great. Or if you don't have your hands as readily available, but also, Screenshots are weirdly hard. Like whenever I'm teaching somebody to use a phone, an iPhone who hasn't used an iPhone before, they always struggle with it. And it's exactly what you said. Everybody always pushes the power button before the volume button, and then the phone just turns off before they can take the screenshot. Uh, it's sort of like you got to get used to the little rhythm of it, of how to like double tap to get that screenshot. But it's kind of tricky, especially if you have a, a iPhone Max where it's kind of a big screen. It's a big reach. So this is yeah. a really nice, fe a really nice way of going about it. My problem with this fe feature is that I feel like I'm gonna forget. Like whenever I'm taking a screenshot, you have to remember it. So this is why it's good to subscribe to our newsletter so we can remind you of things like this if you already knew. Yeah, definitely. I think that like now it's become so second nature for me to take screenshots, but I used to be one of those people that um, had a hard time getting it to work right. And also like what I just described was pressing the side button and the volume button at the same time, volume down button at the same time but um, it will vary also depending on your device. Some iPads have a top button instead of a mm -hmm. side button. Some older iPhones have like look a little different too. And so this just eliminates having to know which buttons to press at the same time. <laughs> um, and you know, you can use it the same way on all of your iOS devices. Yeah, can I throw in a bonus tip for people? 
Yeah. So this is not from the tip of the week. This is just from the mind of David. Uh, <laughs> so we have, if you go into the Photos app and then you go into Albums and you scroll down, there's actually an Albums called Screenshots. And that's a nice way to quickly free up a little bit of storage because A, usually if you're taking a screenshot of something, it's for a short time use. It's like you want to show somebody something that you saw on your phone. Like for example, I saw a deal on a flight today. So I took a screenshot of it and, and texted it to my partner. I don't need to look at that a year later. Uh, and B, I don't know about you, but like I always accidentally take screenshots. Does that happen to you? Yeah, constantly. <laughs> constantly. So this is a really nice way. If you go and you look at that album, you can just delete everything in that album. And it, it frees up some storage for you. It's not going to be a lot of storage. But like I'm looking right now, and I have done this before, so it's not as built up as some people. I have 308 screenshots. How about you? How, how many, many screenshots have. do you have? Yeah. Um, so photos, albums, scrolling down to screenshots. Oh, my gosh. I have 1,032 I need to go through and I, I can guarantee that like most of them are probably not not something that I need anymore um, but I, yeah I, mean, I wanted to ask you quickly like what are things that you screenshot and it might be nice just to give some I people ideas of why this feature is useful yeah that's a really good question okay well first of all let me just preface all this by saying you and I probably have more screenshots than the average person because we often take screenshots for work uh, if, if you actually subscribe to our tip of the day newsletter or any of our services, you'll see we have a lot of screenshots built in. So that's obviously some of it. I'm looking now mm -hmm. at my screenshots to see what it is I'm screenshotting. It's almost always this exact scenario that there's something on my phone uh, that I want to share with somebody else. And it's a really quick, easy way to do that. Um, so like, I mean, it's, it, it's often silly things. Like if I see something on Facebook and like a friend of mine commented on something and I want to tell my partner about it or like I'm just scrolling through as I'm doing this and looking. Um, it, it's always that. It's just like random things I see on Facebook or on anything that I'm looking at that I want to quickly and easily send to a friend. Uh, that's how I do it. How about you? Am I, I feel like I'm not doing a good job giving good use cases here. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you mentioned something about a travel itinerary. That's one example of something that you might want to share. Um, I like, I'm looking recently, I looked up lyrics of a song that I liked and I took a screenshot of that to remember it. Um, a lot of times it's not like something really essential. It's more for the fun of it. Yeah, if I see something outrageous on Facebook that I want to share with a friend, uh, I might screenshot it and send it to them. Um, sometimes yeah. it'll be like a photo that I don't need a super high resolution version of or something, an image that I see somewhere that I just want to remember. Um, and I'll screenshot yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. No, and that's what I'm thinking of. Like a couple times, I've screen like I'm I'm looking in here. I'll screenshot menus and uh, like if I'm looking online, rather than trying to like text somebody a link to the place I'm looking, I'll just quickly screenshot a menu and text it. Another actually pretty good use case that I'm seeing here is sometimes <laughs> if I want to send somebody a photo of something I'm seeing on Instagram, there actually is not an easy way to do that. And a screenshot is so. I mean, it's a silly use case, but yeah. like. A lot of times it's like if I'm seeing a meme, <laughs> I'll screenshot the meme and text it or something like that, especially if it's on a private account. Sometimes memes are on private accounts. I'm getting really deep in the like life of David right now. But <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good one. Another one is like not everyone is on social media. So I, I follow yeah. some animal rescues on Instagram, but my husband has completely extricated himself from social media he is like not on it anymore so if i see a dog that i think is cute that maybe we would consider rescuing i'll screenshot it and send it to him that's another Aww. example <laughs> uh, um okay there was yeah, a really cute use... rottweiler which a different family got so i <laughs> it's probably for the best because a rottweiler would be a handful but <laughs> <laughs> rottweilers are a handful <laughs> Um, another thing I'll do a lot is if I'm wanting to, if I have a, converse, a conversation with somebody and then I want to like tell somebody else about it, there's not a really easy way to like do that other than a screenshot. So I'll, I'll, I'll screenshot like a text conversation and then text it to somebody else if they're relevant to that conversation but weren't on the thread. Yeah, um, that let's makes make sense. this the question of the week. Uh, I'm going to make this a two parter. Part number one. How many screenshots do you have? And can you beat Donna's? How many do you have? You had a thousand and what? A uh, thousand thirty-two. 
is there anybody out there who can beat Donna's 1,032 screenshots? <laughs> and number two, are there use cases for screenshots that you find particularly handy that you'd like to share with us? And we will share with our podcast listeners. Thank you. Yes, email us at podcast at iphonelife.com. So next, I want to tell you about our premium subscription, which is called iPhone Life Insider. And you sign up and it's a monthly subscription and you get access to a ton of different content types that help you master your devices. Uh, you've got uh, insider guides, they're in-depth video and written guides that um, teach you uh, features like the new iOS's or um, we have a complete iPad guide, we're coming out with an AirPods guide, things like that. We also have a video version of our daily tip you get a digital subscription to iPhone Life magazine, including our full archive of over 30 past issues. You also get a feature called Ask an Editor. If you're having an issue with one of your devices and you don't easily find an answer through our website, you can email us and one of our experts will help you personally solve that problem. And you also get an exclusive version of this podcast with premium content and none of the ads. So if you go to iphonelife.com slash podcast discount, you can get an extra discount at, for being a podcast listener. Um, and uh, we are coming out with an AirPods guide, as I mentioned, this weekend. And next month, we have an iPhone 12 Pro camera guide coming out. So it's a great time to join and uh, get in on that right away. We have so much great content coming out. It's been We've been working really hard over the last month or so, uh, getting everything ready for the new year. And we've got such an awesome year planned, uh, starting this weekend with the AirPods guide. If any of you have AirPods, you have to check out this guide. It's over. I was just talking to Nicholas, who some of you remember from the podcast. He said it's over an hour of content. I think it's like 30 plus videos. So if you're sitting here and you're like, oh, I don't need to know anything about the AirPods. They're easy. You just throw them in your ear. There is so much to learn. <laughs> it's wild. Uh, so make sure you check that out if you are already an insider or if you're not, go subscribe at iphonelife.com slash podcast. And it's really nice with the guides because we split up the videos into like little short segments. So you can also jump around. If you already know how to pair your AirPods, you don't have to watch that video. You can get to the part where you're learning how to pair two AirPods to the same iPhone, things like that. Um, so you can just learn what's most interesting to you. I forgot to mention one of our uh, most exciting features of Insider is courses. We've added yeah, now, we're say. doing <laughs> four courses a year um, and you get unlimited access to these live online courses as a subscriber. So we just added this in 2020 and um, starting in March, we're having our first course of 2021. It's gonna be our iPhone fundamentals course, which helps you just make sure you have the foundation of all of the main things you need to know as an iPhone user but we also have an iPad course this year. We're gonna have iOS 15 and also a photos and camera course, I believe was our fourth one or I have to mm -hmm. double check. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's a lot like, and this is a really great format because you get to interact live with your instructors. David and I are teachers for many of them. Colin is another one of our instructors and it's been a huge, uh, huge success so far and been, I think a really great way to learn for a lot of our subscribers. Yeah, especially if you're a podcast listener, clearly you're somebody who enjoys this format. And it's a similar format, but it's actually, in my opinion, more engaging because you can ask questions and go back and forth. Uh, and we also have a goal of having months that we do not have classes, we're gonna have workshops. So each month we're gonna either have a class or a workshop for you. Uh, we got a lot this year. So iphonelife.com slash podcast discount and go ahead and subscribe. You won't regret it. And if you do, we have a 60 day money back guarantee, <laughs> but you won't. <laughs> so it's zero risk to you. No risk at all. So one of our insider subscribers recently sent us a question, which I wanted to read out to you because I think the answer will probably interest many of you. He says, as I used to type messages or emails, when I got to the end of a sentence and skipped two spaces, it would add a period automatically. I'm not aware that I changed anything, but now it does not. I'm not too lazy to do this on my own, but loved that feature. Somehow I lost it, but I never deliberately decided not to use it. I'd like it back, Ken. So here's Sorry, our response. Ken. Yeah, gotcha, fortunately. And I just wanted to say too, I, I think for a lot of people listening, you might not be aware of that feature and it is really convenient and makes typing faster. 
Yeah, I was just getting ready to say it's a nice little like hidden tip in there because I love that feature. You're not lazy, Ken. It does save time. I always do the double tap the space bar to get a period. Also, fun fact, it works on Mac. So if you're typing on a Mac, you can double tap the space bar and it works too. Ah, oh, I don't, I maybe knew that at one point, but I don't use that. I should. <laughs> I, I discovered it recently. Somehow it's like, it's intuitive on an iPhone, but like you wouldn't think it would work on a standard keyboard on a Mac, but it does. Cool. So the response to Ken's question is, gotcha. Fortunately, this function is still available. Go to settings, general keyboards, then look for, there's a little period shortcut under all keyboards. Make sure that it is toggled on, the slider is to the right, and the bar is green. If it's already on, try toggling it off, then back on again. If that doesn't work, try resetting your iPhone. Uh, and then, so, instead, if that doesn't work, message me again, and we can look at other options. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely go in and check out your keyboard settings to make sure that that little um, period shortcut is toggled on. And yeah, that's a good one. I thought that was a good one to share because it uh, included within it a tip for people who don't know that keyboard trick. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, we have a couple of comments from listeners I also wanted to share. Uh, we love it when you all email us with answers to our questions of the week, or even if just in general you have thoughts you want to share with us, please feel free to. So this one, they didn't write their name, they just said from M. <laughs> Um, but we had asked a while back if, if other people thought that making a FaceTime call unannounced without texting first to set it up, whether people think that is socially acceptable or not. So this person says, no, it's not acceptable. I can't emphasize this enough. As you can ima imagine, with my email address, it gets annoying. Oh, I'm not, I don't know. No, here, I, I, I can clarify with this because somebody, oh. wh whoever wrote this comment in here was savvy because we don't want to share it. And the reason why is their email address is their first name at iCloud.com. And so it's like they must have been a very early adopter because it's a very common first name that happens to start with an M uh, at iCloud.com. Uh, and so as you can imagine, uh, people mess up and and, and email them or call them all the time because it's such a common name and they have such a good email address. <laughs> oh, okay. So this person says they simply will not answer and it sounds like whether or not it was someone they knew calling or not. Um, and so that was, that was good validation, David, because I think you and I both had a really strong opinion about this. I can also just relate to M's problem because my last name starts with an A. I get so many pocket dials because whenever you go into contacts, really? if you're sorting, if you're sorting by alphabetical order, uh, it's by last name. I'm always first. I'm often first in people's lists, and people accidentally call me so much. It's really frustrating. It's, For some reason, the only person, the only person who pocket dials me is my mother-in-law, but she pro it's probably like four times a week for a while there that she would be <laughs> calling me by accident. Um, but yeah, I, I, I maintain the only person that is welcome to FaceTime me unannounced is my six-year-old nephew. He's allowed that's to do fair. that, but that's, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I love how you and I are both like, our partners, no, they should text first. <laughs> it's reserved for yeah. children. I'm standing by that. All right, I've got one more <laughs> comment from listeners that a uh, listener, Nancy, wrote in. Well, you asked, oh, this was, we asked what people thought of the app library, which is a new iOS 14 feature. She says, the groupings in the app library are bizarre. I love the concept of the app library itself, but the next step is to be able to group apps together that make sense to the user, not to Apple. Why are some of my news apps grouped together, but not all? Like she says, global news went into a different bin in the app library than um, the BBC and other ones. Why are some of my favorite, why are some of my Apple apps together, app store and support, but not all of them? iTunes and Apple stores. It would be perfect if this option was included in the next update, Nancy. And I think this is a great point. Um, yeah. The most useful, like so for people who aren't aware of what we mean by the app library, if you swipe right to left on your home screen all the way through your different app screens, you'll get to a display called the app library and there you'll see um, little clusters of apps in different categories. For me, the, the one that I find the most useful is suggestions and recently added. Those are at the top. 
And those, it's, it'll show you apps you've been using a lot. So a lot of times that is what you're looking for. And then recently added, if you've just downloaded apps, you'll, you might want to find them too. But I agree that the other groupings aren't really, it's not necessarily how I would do it. And I'd rather be able to just choose it myself. What about no, you, David? I, yeah, no, I, I really agree with Nancy. I've had the same thought. And it wouldn't be very hard to do to be able to build a folder based on a rule. So you could have, show me a folder that has all games in it or a folder you know there's all sorts of ways you could build rules that build folders around them and i do agree that apple they do an okay job um but not a great job and i think that the fact that you can't control them and it sort of like randomly sorts it each time makes it hard because whenever i go to my app library it takes quite a bit of cognitive overhead just to figure out like what i'm seeing you know what i mean yeah um, one thing, I mean, you still can create folders on your app screens if you want, but that's also like a little weird if you've created like a news app folder on your app screen and then there's a news section of your app library and it has different apps in it. Like it's that Apple is choosing for you. It's just a little awkward. Yeah, what I would like, and it sounds like this is what Nancy would like too, is I would like to have in the app library the ability to create a folder, but not like have to go and manually add every app that I want in there, but have a rule that says, this folder is a news folder. Please put all the news apps that I have in this folder. And then it does mm. it automatically. And it's yeah, funny that talking would be cool. about it because <laughs> up until this point when I've talked about the app library, I've always thought about it as being a feature I really like. And now that we're talking about it, what I'm realizing is I actually almost never use the app library. The feature that I like is that it hides all my home screens. <laughs> and I just use search to navigate. Like that's 95% of the time I'm just using search to navigate to my app. How about you? Do you like use the Excuse app me. library? Bless you. <laughs> um, I do use the app library all the okay. time actually. Cause I've, uh. I've, um, I have customized my home screen now where I just have one app screen and then it swipes right to the app library. So it's, okay. um, it just makes it so accessible and right there that I tend to use it. Sometimes I'll go there and not see what I'm looking for and still there's use the search bar at the top. So mm -hmm. I end up searching for an app that way. That's such an easy way to find apps. I think that you and I both can say strongly recommend that to people if they're not already doing it. Uh, but I do end up, I swipe over to the app library multiple times a day and look at okay. it. Okay, okay, good job. See, I have two I have two screens. I have my like home screen, which I have a bunch of widgets and a few apps. Actually, there's mm -hmm. more on that to come. I'm gonna talk about that in our special insider section. Ooh. Uh, and then, but I have a second screen where I have like some frequently used apps that didn't make the cut on the first screen and I have a few folders. So I've got like one more layer between me and the app library. Uh, but usually I'll just swipe down and search. Um, and just while we're cool. talking about it, I let uh, we'll just let me just tell people how to hide home screens because I know if you're sitting here being like, how do you hide home screens? What are they talking about? Let's just explain it. If you do a long press um, on an app, uh, it will it, uh, their option will come up to edit home screen. Um, or actually, I think it just does automatically, and you'll you'll know it because every app will go into is it jiggle mode? Is that, is that the official term now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then on the bottom of the screen, where you see the little dots that tells you which of your home screens you're on, if you tap on that, it will give you the option to show or hide home screens, and that's where you do it. Awesome. Thanks, David. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> okay. I have, um, for our news section this week, I had something I wanted to update everybody on. Um, unless, was there anything el else you wanted to talk about with the app library, David? Nope, I am done with the app library. Okay. So in the news this week, Apple issued a warning, which I thought was important to share with all of our listeners, just in case it applies to anybody, that the iPhone 12 with the magnets that it has in it, the MagSafe magnets it has in it, and MagSafe accessories that go with it um, should be kept six inches at least away from any medical devices such as pacemakers because it can actually interfere with them. So, I mean, six inches, you'd have to be holding that pretty close to you, like having it in a front shirt pocket or something like that for it to be an issue. So for most people, it's probably still fine to be using those devices, but I thought that's definitely like, you know, a medical device like a pacemaker is very important, doing very an important job. So. Um, 
it's really good to be aware of this. So I just wanted to wanted to share that. Yeah, that definitely is important. Uh, I was reading online, though, I think in general, even phones that don't have MagSafe, it's not recommended to keep a phone that close to a pacemaker. So I think it's something that is already an issue that probably if you have a pacemaker, you're pretty aware of. But it did seem to be that the MagSafe was not helping on that front. That's true. It probably like doctors, if you're getting a pacemaker, will already like tell you what types of devices to keep away from it. And I think the deal with the iPhone 12, it just has more ma- it has more magnets in it. But I think a lot of the other iPhones also have some magnets in it. That might be an issue. I think that's what I was reading. But uh, the part I know for sure is just keep it six inches at least away. Yeah. So no phone in the breast. So pocket. that's it for that one. Well, the only other news item that I did. Uh, I didn't get time to test this out before our episode, but um, I'm kind of excited to is that Apple just released a new feature with its Apple Fitness Plus fitness subscription that has like audio guided walks. It'll Ooh. it's called time to walk and it will give you reminders of when when um, I think it gives you reminders of when to walk. But the main thing is that it has different celebrities do like audio storytelling while you're going on walks. One of them was Dolly Parton. <laughs> and so I, I was particularly thought that would be fun to check out. But it would be fun to add this to the question of the week to have anybody who has an Apple Watch, because you do need an Apple Watch to use Apple Fitness Plus, which um, I was confused about early on, because if you mm-hmm. have an Apple Watch paired, it will still let you play the videos even if you're not wearing your Apple Watch. So. I don't really know why Apple did it that way, but you do need to have an Apple Watch paired to your iPhone in order for that Fitness Plus tab to even show up in your fitness app as an option for you. So um, it's a cool fitness subscription option that I've been enjoying um, for Apple Watch users. And so email us podcast at iphonelife.com to let us know how you're liking Fitness Plus and also if you've tried the new time to walk feature and if you like it. Are you, let's, I'm going to turn this question right around on you, Donna. Have you kept using Fitness Plus? I know you were testing it out. I have not. (laughs) I used it for like two (laughs) weeks straight. I've noticed with my Apple Watch use in general, I'll um, I'll kind of go through different times of inspiration where I I use it and it does effectively motivate me to work out more. Um, Mm -hmm. But then I'll just fall off the bandwagon. I still feel like it's an effective device for me because I'll, you know, take a couple weeks on, a couple weeks off, but I'm still consistently using it. Um, But with the Fitness Plus, um, I still prefer if I can to work out with other people in person, but I still thought that this was a good, a a very good experience if you are doing an at-home workout, but that's just not my preference. Yeah, I so I did go ahead and test it out, as I I said I would. I felt like, so I did yoga, which is probably not necessarily the best case study for this. I did like that my watch was displayed on the screen and I could see my metrics because I do get a little bit obsessed with always checking what my heart rate is and what like how many calories I've burned and how long it's been. And so I did like that. But I think I stand by my assessment that we said uh, when we originally talked about, which is the thing that would really take it and make it a really valuable service would be if they were leveraging your heart rate information to customize the workout similar to what we talked about what's what's it called it's like uh orange theory or something Mm -hmm. um where you know if you're the goal so orange theory is this workout system where you have a heart rate monitor on and the goal is to always keep your heart rate within a certain range and that's like the optimal for health and fitness or weight loss or whatever uh and so clearly i haven't done it (laughs) (laughs) um but like if you had systems like that where that you were customizing the workout to keep your heart rate within a certain range based on your apple watch and displaying it on the tv using fitness plus that would be amazing but just having my apple watch be on the screen it's like i can look at my apple watch it's not that hard it's right here and so it i didn't find it was a particularly noteworthy service it seemed very similar to all the other services that are out there and similar price too so yeah i i haven't used you've also used the peloton app haven't you yeah and you you really liked that yeah i I mean i did i i didn't think that the it was necessarily particularly better than apple fitness they were kind of comparable 
but I thought that Apple Fitness, the thing that Apple does is they integrate services in hardware. And I think that is the whole benefit of why Apple like justifies getting into services when really they're a consumer technology company. But here it felt like they didn't quite take the leap into doing that enough. So it was just another Peloton app, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, just a, one thing about the heart rate zones that Orange Theory does is um, mm-hmm. Apple Fitness Plus does have a uh, feature that will show you like how your how your um, heart rate and movement compares to other people who've taken that class. And okay. it, I've just noticed it only shows up in some workouts. I don't know if it's because it's a new service and there isn't enough data yet for some of them, or maybe they don't do it for yoga and they only do it for more like cardio intensive stuff. Maybe. But that when I did see it showing up, I was that was nice to be like, how am I doing kind of compared to the average person in terms of calorie burn during this workout? That I should test, yeah. Yeah, because I think that that definitely like adds to the motivation factor we we're talking about. But it'd be better, I'd be happier if they had like heart rate zones and told you, okay, like now is the time of the workout where you're supposed to push it like to the max. And then here's yeah. where you take it down a little bit and have like a kind of like a heart rate zone guided workout. Especially for things like spin, where it's like really hard to tell like how hard you're pushing yourself relative to other people around you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so having it based on heart rate makes a lot of sense. One thing I will say is from the, I, I went to one Orange Theory class and I felt, to be honest, like I was going to die, it was so hard. <laughs> and it was actually a very demotivating to discover at the end that I was like way below other people in terms of calorie burn and, and you, heart rate zone. You want like a yellow theory. <laughs> yeah, I was yellow theory. <laughs> Maybe even green theory. <laughs> but I was like, wow, I feel like I was working so hard, but oh well. I definitely agree with that. And I'm a little worried with that Apple Watch feature too, to feel like I, busted my butt and then they're like yeah you were like the worst person at this <laughs> oh um one one note i'll share from aaron smith who is a feature writer for us and is also a certified personal trainer is she said she was really impressed with apple fitness plus and that all of the workouts are very scalable and so it's it's nice in that it can, you know it works really well for a bunch of different ages and strength levels and you'll be given different options like for instance a plank or you could be on your knees or, and they'll like tell you that in a clear way um, th- as you work out, which I think is really important. That is good. All right, let's move on to our app and gear section. Do you have anything yeah. you wanna share, David? I do, I have a, one that I'm excited to share with you guys. I think I have mentioned it before, full disclaimer, but I know the Super Bowl's coming up. So I wanna, I wanna share my TV recommendation for people, which is I've been using YouTube TV all football season and I'm really enjoying it. Um, it's I, slightly more expensive than some of the other options there, but it includes local channels, which I really enjoy. And the user interface I find to be so much better than any other uh, streaming service. So yeah, YouTube TV, just if you aren't familiar with it, it's a app where you can use it on your phone or your Apple TV or your iPad. Uh, I tend to use it on my Apple TV or I'll watch it in bed on my iPad if I'm honest. Uh, but it's, uh, a, it's an app for watching live TV. It's about $70. I think if you do Sling, which is another option you may want to look into, it's probably close to like $40. So it's a little bit, I mean, it's quite a bit more expensive, but you get local channels in that and it is, um, I just really like the user interface of it. I find it really easy to use. So if you are wanting a streaming service for the Super Bowl, I think they have a seven day free trial, so you could probably just do that. Uh, But I've been using it and enjoying it for, you know, watching sports live also. you know, there's just been a lot of news and watching the news and things like that. Every once in a while, I do still watch live TV, and I like having it for that. Okay, Donna, so what's your app or gear of the week? So I have an app that I'm going to share this week that Tyler recommended for me. And Tyler is my husband, and he um, loves golfing and has been using an app called Golf Shot, which it has a lot of free features. You don't have to upgrade to the paid version. Um, he just uses the completely free version. So I wanted to explain that first. And um, he is a big Apple Watch fan. So you have to have a GPS Apple Watch in order to get the most out of this app. It also has an iPhone app. Um, most of the recent Apple Watch, all the recent Apple Watch models have GPS. So that shouldn't be a problem for you. 
Um, and so what the app does is it basically tells you where you're located in the golf course and how close you are to the hole. And so on your, on your phone, you can see a view that shows you like the whole golf course. And on your watch, you'll see uh, the, like where, the hole and your distance from it. And, um, and so you can leave your phone in the golf cart, which is nice too. Oh, the other thing I was gonna add is that apparently like he golfs a lot and has golfed all over the world from the tiny little town in Iowa uh, where we lived to like golf courses in Ireland and said so far it's had all of the golf courses available there. Yeah, that's really cool. And not just that it's free. Uh, he said he's has... not sure about Ireland, actually. But I know he's been to golf courses in Ireland. He didn't know about Golf Shot yet then. So he's not going to promise that. I love that we have a live fact checker. We should just have people sit here while we do podcasts and they can correct us for all the things we say. Because half the time we're wrong. No, just kidding. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I feel it's not just you can leave your phone in the car. It's also in the cart. It's that... Um, that's not something that I'm information I'm used to having when I golf. I don't golf very often, but when I do, knowing distance to pin really does help me decide what golf club to use. And sometimes, the, you know, it's hard to tell if elevation is a little funky, like how far I am from the hole. So it is really useful information to have. And the fact that it's free on all those golf courses, that's cool. So it's called what? Top Shot? Golf Shot. Golf Shot. Okay. I actually <laughs> just got a, a game called, I think, Top Shot, <laughs> which is why that was in my head. And there's also Top Golf is like is that chain of places where you can go and like get beers and snacks and golf, right? Yeah, people <laughs> need to be more creative with their names. <laughs> but yeah, no, this is Golf Shot. Okay. So give it a and try. I have not. I am not a golfer, so I have not tried it myself. But Tyler has tested it extensively and loves it. Um, but I'll I'll link to it if you go to iPhoneLife.com/podcast. Uh, you can look at the show notes for the episode and I'll, I'll include a link there and a little description more of how, of how it works. Great. Um, all right. So we've already shared our, a couple questions of the week. And so I think that wraps up this episode of the, of the iPhone Life podcast. I think it does. Thanks, everybody, <laughs> for tuning in. If you're an insider, make sure you stick around and we'll have some bonus content for you. Uh, and if not, if you all could just do us a favor and rate review the app in the app store or in the podcast app i mean rate and review the podcast in the podcast app this is what i'm <laughs> saying uh especially if you rate it and review it positively it helps other people find it and then we do this service for free and it helps us build our audience so we really appreciate when you do that thank you yes that would be wonderful have a good week and we'll be back in a couple of weeks with the next episode thanks everyone